very much, uh, Jim, and thank, thanks to you all for um, the invitation to, to speak today. I'm very uh, pleased to be able to, um, to join you in your seminar series and look forward to, um, to, to discussing um, this um, project with, with you and, and look forward to um, question and answers afterwards as well. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm talking about um, a project called Cherish, which is climate, heritage and environments of reefs, islands and headlands. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of the whole project. So, um, but particularly with a paleo environmental perspective, that's, as, as, as Jim said, that's the sort of main area of my research. But it's a multidisciplinary project involving geoscientists, archaeologists, geochronologists, um, uh, and, and so we, we sort of uh, come, come together to, to explore um, this issue through um, uh, uh, what was originally a, a five year project, but has been extended to uh, six and a half years. So we started in January 2017 and we're running through until June 2023. Um, and we're funded by um, the Island Wales Territorial Cooperation Programme, uh, otherwise known as Interreg. Um, and um, there are four partners involved in the project, the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historic Monuments of Wales, who are leading the project, um, uh, ourselves at Aberystwyth University, um, the Discovery Programme, Centre for Archaeology and Innovation in Ireland, and the Geological Survey of Ireland. So we're working together um, across the, 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 the coastal the coastal zones of, of Ireland and Wales to explore the impacts of climate change on our cultural heritage. Um, but before I, I, I talk more specifically about the sort of heritage angle, um, these two maritime nations, we don't really have to um, look too far to think about the impacts of climate change uh, on, on our nations. And particularly in, in Wales, um, one example has, has really sort of captured um, the, um, the, the news um, and, and the headlines really, uh, and that's the community of Fairbourne in South Gwynedd, where um, there's been a lot of discussion about how to cope with the impact of rising sea levels and you know, what will happen in, in the future. And the, the suggestion is that the, the community you know, has a limited lifespan and that, you know, that, will, that, that the community will need to, to move over the coming decades and how quickly the community has to move is, is open to question. But the idea here is that, that, that Fairbourne is representing, you know, the, um, the UK's first climate refugees, um, potentially. And, and you know, the, this, this quote here that this is going to happen elsewhere, you know, they, they just happen to be to be the first. Now, if we take that longer term perspective um, over, over millennia and think about the archaeological context, we can perhaps think of other examples where communities have had to adapt and relocate over time. But in terms of our very recent focus, that this is a very real um, concern and threat to a number of communities around our coasts. But how can the coastal, the, the coastal heritage angle contribute to our understanding and the, of climate change and, and the debates around it? If we think about um, coastal chain, coastal heritage as a, as a lens to sort of look at climate change, then there are a whole range of climate change impacts that will that we expect um, to to potentially threaten our um, rich cultural heritage around the coasts of Ireland and Wales. And there's a few examples here in this in this um, in this cartoon: sea level rise, increased storminess the increased intensity of rainfall. We'll also see the impact of rising temperatures and those um, changes of temperatures that might increase vulnerability and, and stability of the landscape and monuments. Drought impact is an interesting one because increased drought might actually reveal more archeological features and reveal new archeological features, particularly one example that's in the bottom left of those photographs was revealed in, in um, the drought of 2018. So whilst we might see a, a, a larger number of threats, there are some opportunities as well. And certainly one area that is an opportunity is to learn more about our coastal heritage before it succumbs to the impacts of climate change and, and, and how can we record and preserve that information in the face of, of damage and loss. So 
I think it's also important to acknowledge the role of the Climate Heritage Network. And this is a group that has come together over recent years and, and has been really spearheaded by um, ICOMOS, the International Council on Monuments and Sites through, through the UN, um, but has also um, been, been driven by people like Hannah Fluck at, at um, Historic England and, and um, colleagues at Historic Environment Scotland have really tried to, to, to highlight the role that heritage can play in climate change debates. And, and the, the heritage community was very well represented at COP26 and, and perhaps played a more prominent role, that, that um, role of cultural heritage in the arts played a much more prominent role at the most recent COP than, than has done previously. And that is a, a growing um, body of, of researchers, stakeholders, um, policy makers, and communities. So I think that's an important um, sort of broader context to, um, to, to include there as well. So going back to what we're about in terms of, um, in terms of Cherish, um, there are a number of key objectives that we have. Um, firstly, we're interested in assessing, monitoring and mapping coastal heritage at key sites in Ireland and Wales. We are developing new archaeological and paleoenvironmental investigations at sites around the coast, which are deemed to be at risk and, and, and vulnerable. And we're using that information to try to provide an improved evidence base for statutory protection, to inform decision making, management um, of individual sites and adaptation strategies um, in these locations as well. But a big part of what we're doing is about raising awareness of climate change in coastal communities through the lens of heritage. Um, people really care about their, her that their heritage and, and local sites um, are as important in that conversation and that debate as those nationally important and internationally important monumental sites as well. And that's something that we've, we've learned through the course of the project. So those are our sort of key um, aims really. In terms of where we're working, we're working on um, a range of sites around the coast of Wales from Stackpole in Pembrokeshire in the south of Wales um, all the way round um, to um, Anglesey and the north and then um, we've got we've got a series of small areas which are there's, there's 13 small areas that we'd identify specific sites and, and areas that we'd identified in Wales in Ireland, our partners have identified some slightly larger sections of, of coastline. Um, we've got five areas of coastline going round from um, just north of, of, of Dublin all the way round um, to um, the Dingle Peninsula and the Maharees um, over in, in the west. So, so that, those are our study areas. So we've got quite a lot of ground to cover, um, which is, um, so it's a good job. We've got a, a good stretch of time to be able to um, to apply our resources to this. And we're looking at a range of different sites, um, different ages, um, going through from more recent historical sites like lighthouses and um, uh, medieval castles back to um, Iron Age um, promontory forts, um, and also including submerged heritage, and particularly in the near shore and intertidal zone as well. So we've got quite a wide scope of sites, a geographical area and time periods to, to take in, to try to sort of incorporate the, the breadth of the, the kinds of heritage sites and issues that, that um, are facing the impacts of climate change. In terms of what we're actually doing, um, we've got a, because we've, we've got four partners which bring different skill sets, we've got a wide range of tools available to us both from, from land, sea and air to investigate um, the impacts of climate change on coastal heritage. So airborne um, LIDAR, um, aerial photographs uh, and, and drones um, are being used to, to provide that broader scale monitoring and that, that aerial perspective. We've got a range of fine resolution um, uh, terrestrial surveys, laser scanning, geophysical surveys, and then some more invasive excavation sampling. Um, where we come in from Aberystwyth University is focusing particularly on developing paleo-environmental records and geochronology to get that longer term perspective on climate change. So whilst 
and some of our colleagues are focusing on the on the very fine scale um, monitoring that, that, that that's going on during the course of the project we're taking that longer view to put that that current and, and near future change into that longer term context of how um, how the landscape is changing over over time and also to help us understand the environmental context of some of the archaeological sites that we encounter um, at the time of their occupation. So I'm just going to give you a, a, a brief overview of some of the, 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 the work that our colleagues have been doing before focusing more on the, the longer term perspective and that paleo environmental angle that, that we're focusing on from Aberystwyth. So we've undertaken um, LIDAR surveys of six of the I, uh, Welsh islands. Um, and that's helped to identify new archaeological features. So this is an example from Ramsey Island in, in North Pembrokeshire, just off um, uh, near St David's. And by manipulating the um, LIDAR images, it's, it's possible to see the relief and the um, high resolution landscape features, which can then be um, investigated in terms of um, identifying whether we've got new archaeological features that are previously unrecorded. So there's a couple of examples um, here. The, the top one um, here is a possible promontory um, enclosure which was previously unrecorded. And um, uh, further, further down on the, the coast of the island there, possible site of the, the lost uh, Capel de Vanog, which has been recorded historically but not um, featured in the archaeological record. So as well as providing this high resolution monitoring, which can be compared and provides a baseline for future surveys. There's also that element of, of providing a new, new additions to the historical um, monument record. And uh, Dan Hunt at the Royal Commission of Ancient Historic Monuments of Wales has, has, um, has focused on, on that research. Our colleagues at the Geological Survey of Ireland are taking this high resolution monitoring and, and surveying approach underwater and using their capabilities of, of um, to, to, um, to survey um, submerged heritage, notably in the form of shipwrecks. Um, and here we've got an example from of the Manchester Merchant, uh, which sank on route to New Orleans, on route from New Orleans to Manchester. So this is off the coast of, of Kerry. And um, surveys that were done previously for Infomar in 2009 can be compared with the 2019 survey that was done in part of Cherish to see how that submerged heri heritage is changing and being affected by ocean currents um, ov over time. So lots of monitoring going on. We can also record um, extreme events as well, the impacts of the sort of more extreme events and often coastal erosion will, will happen in chunks rather than gradually. Um, and this example here is from Dunbeg um, on the Dingle Peninsula in, in County Kerry, where our colleagues at the Discovery Programme have been monitoring, they've actually been monitoring this prior to the start of the Cherish project. But they've also gone back to historical records from the um, late um, 19th, 19th century to, to chart the, the progression of, of, the, um, of the erosion at, at this site. And it's, it's certainly accelerated over recent years. There's been a number of, of um, uh, big um, losses over the last um, three or four years, which have been documented and recorded and are able to um, laser scan these and then quantify the amount of material that's being that's being lost. And, and clearly there's, there's um, significant impacts on the safety at this site in terms of visitors, as well as the, the, the preservation of, of heritage there. So so those are some of the just, just sort of some examples that, that our colleagues are, are working on um, across the across the study areas. And what I'm going to talk about now is, is that that longer view um, that, that I mentioned um, through obtaining sediment cores um, from lakes, uh, from lagoons, from coastal wetlands, from peat bogs in the coastal zone to try to help us reconstruct past environmental change. So we're looking for that longer term record of climate change to put some of our recent challenges into perspective, but also for evidence of past extreme events in the paleo environmental and sedimentary record that perhaps given us an understanding of that longer term um, dynamic nature of the, of the environments that we're working in. So 
this climate change and extreme events were interested in that longer term coastal landscape change and, and evolution in, in the geomorphological sense of, of how these sites have developed over time. And the other aspect that we're working on is that we need to develop robust chronologies and our colleagues, um, Professor Helen Roberts and Professor Jeff Duller, focusing particularly on um, uh, the, the um, a technique um, called luminescence dating. So, which is really valuable in this coastal zone because it's ideally suited for um, for application and quartz-based um, sediments. So sand dunes, um, wind-blown sand, um, those kinds of deposits, it's it's suited very well. And um, we're very lucky in Aberystwyth that they are, um, you know, one of the have developed one of the world's leading laboratories in this technique here. So we're able to combine our long our paleo environmental reconstructions with um, radiocarbon dating, which is perhaps our more standard chronological technique over the Holocene, but linking that with um, luminescence dating as well to, to where often radiocarbon dating isn't, isn't viable in some sedimentary sequences. So we're sort of trying to bring together this sort of multi-perspective um, multi sort of toolkit. So we're taking sediment cores from lakes, bogs, wetlands. We're also analysing sand dune sequences and spits. We're working in conjunction with our colleagues at the archaeological sites that they're investigating. So I'm just going to give you some examples now of the kinds of um, sites that we're working on. And one particular area that we focused on is the, the north um, northwest coast of, of Wales um, that, that brings us around to um, just south of Carnarvon from Dinas Dinfle in the south, which I'll talk about shortly, um, through South West Anglesey. And this whole area we're kind of considering as one large sort of landscape unit, although we're investigating a number of different sites in the area. And you can see from these um, satellite images that there are extensive um, sand dune um, systems at Newborough Warren, which is a famous one that many of you will, will have heard of as well as Abba Frau, and they extend, you know, a couple of kilometres inland. Um, and we've got a, a spit that's developed here at, at Morfordinthe as well. So we've got some really interesting coastal geomorphology. We've got a couple of uh, lakes, um, which provide opportunities for um, getting uh, new paleoenvironmental data. And we've got some interesting archaeological sites, uh, a medieval, early medieval homestead at Rivgaia, and a, a, a promontory fort at uh, Dinas Dintle. The prevailing narrative in this area has been one of medieval storminess. There are a number of historical records which point to enhanced storminess in the 14th century. Um, and the idea has uh, sort of prevailed that there was a big storm in 1331, and that's written about and, and has clearly been remembered through, through generations. And there are a number of sites around the coast of Wales which, which do um, allude to this, this period of, of storm activity in the medieval period. And that is also supported by previous work that was done by Jeff Duller and uh, Simon Bailey at Abba Frau, that, that sort of big sand dune system, um, a number of years ago, where they took um, sections of, sand, of the, the sand dune system at Abba Frau and um, dated it using luminescence dating. And the oldest um, dates that, that, that they obtained for, lu for the luminescence, for the dates of those, those sand dunes was, was uh, 0.68 Ka, so about 700 years ago, with a more recent phase of activity two to 300 years ago, which was linked to the Little Ice Age. So the, that supported the prevailing view, um, medieval um, storminess, but with more recent activity um, from the Little Ice Age. But we wanted to know whether there was a longer record and so to see whether you know this is a more recent phenomenon or whether it's something that has happened more periodically through the Holocene. So this um, this picture here shows you that the dunes at Abba Frau and a lake is impounded, Lynn Coron is impounded behind the dune system. So the previous luminescence samples were taken in the dunes themselves. We went back to take a core from the from the lake to see whether we could extend that record of, of storminess and sand mobilization uh, further back in time. So we were able to retrieve a two, just under two and a half meters of sediment, so a relatively short sequence, 
it extends back about three and a half thousand years. Um, and we have two distinct sand units in the upper 1.5 meters. So my immediate thought when we first retrieved this sediment was, okay, we've got the medieval phase and we've got the, the little ice age one. So we're kind of confirming what's, what's happened. But actually when we looked at the core in more detail, um, and we've got a geochemical record here, we've got magnetic susceptibility, which gives us an idea of how easy it is to magnetize the sediment and, and inputs of, of mineralogenic matter, particularly iron bearing minerals, and some geochemical indicators uh, here. And the stratigraphy indicates that we, we didn't just have two sand layers, um, these are in the, the sort of um, the small dots in the stratigraphy, um, but we, we actually have um, multiple sand layers. Now the, the dates in red are the, the, um, the radiocarbon dates that we've got and the dates in the sort of paler um, orange colour are luminescence dates from the sand deposits themselves. So we've actually got three sand deposits, one at um, approximately um, uh, 1160 BC, another one at 160 BC and another one at 540 AD. So our sand layers are older than we thought um, and we did wonder what had happened to our uh, medieval um, uh, sand, uh, sand inundation that's talked about in the historical record. And actually when we look at the geochemical data, the, the sand layers are picked out by peaks into, into titanium um, and we have a um, we have some um, some later some later peaks there, which indicate that we have got um, our our later um, our later period of, of sand dune activity as well. And actually, um, the the medieval sand inundation seems to happen a, a little bit earlier, and and this is consistent with information that we have from another site as well that um, starts around a um, thousand AD. So we're building up this, this sort of picture of, of repeated phases of sand mobilization and inundation in this area, which in, indicate um, a, a, a quite a long lived record of, of, um, of um, episodes of storminess and, and uh, sand dune um, mobilization. Moving around the coast um, to uh, Dinas Dintle, which is the um, Iron Age um, uh, promontory fort here. Um, Dinas Dintle is, um, has sort of become a bit of a poster child for the impacts of climate change on coastal heritage because it's pretty obvious to see that it is being lost. And um, you've got very clear uh, ramparts um, and, and ditch and the sort of structure of the, of the um, sort of defended enclosure here and it's being eroded um, away over time. The site is currently managed by the National Trust um, and it has been the subject of some investigations previously, but it hasn't been um, excavated at all. Um, the National Trust and Gwyneth Archaeological Trust have, have done some monitoring over time, but we've been able to join forces with them to, to really try to pull um, a lot of information together. So we've been taking quite a multifaceted approach to work at, at Dinas Dintle both in terms of monitoring the rate of retreat over the course of the project, but also trying to understand the broader landscape context. There's some nice wetland areas behind Dinas Dintle here. So we've been trying to build up a picture of the paleo environments over the late Holocene, um, but also undertaking um, excavation as well to understand the site um, in more detail before it is inevitably lost. I think one of the important things to say about some of this coastal heritage is that we can understand more of it, we can understand about the processes, we can understand about the rates of change. But one of the things that's very difficult to do is to actually think of ways to protect it. And we have to accept that the loss that is inevitable with, with many, if not all of these sites. So my colleague Howell Griffiths has done some work on um, the historic maps and um, histor historic OS maps to try to investigate the um, and quantify um, the, the rates of change at Dinas Dintle. And we can see that um, he, what, he's, what he's got here is, is sort of some, some maximum erosion in metres in terms of certain areas of the site between um, uh, mapping periods um, and 
um, looking at the sort of rates of, er you know, how the rates of erosion have changed over time and to give an idea of how long it might potentially be before this this site is is lost. And um, and so that's been very useful. And there's some areas which are eroding faster. So the the ditches and ramparts seem to be eroding faster than the than the the face um, the, the the face and the, the sort of inner of the fort here. Of course, that um, the the um, the di the ramparts and ditches would have been a, a complete um, ring at some point. So clearly, a substantial proportion of of um, of the promontory fort has already been lost. And we've also been able to capture um, individual um, uh, events following um, following storms um, and, and intense rainfall. I think one of the things that we've noticed is it's the intensity of the rainfall that seems to be doing the most work. There's a period of time after the after a slump like this where the base of the slope is protected um, it sort of armors the base of the slope and as that's gradually gradually worn away then that sort of destabilizes the slope again further but we've got these glacial sediments that um, and then you've got sand overlying them so you've got water percolating through hitting an impermeable layer and destabilizing and then you're getting these big rotational slips so a, a lot's happening in in one go and they're causing some quite quite dramatic changes so we've been um working with our colleagues at the Royal Commission to understand the site better. And our first port of call was rather than excavating was to go over the edge. Um, I didn't go over the edge because I'm scared of heights. So my colleagues did that. Um, and to, this is a, a, a cross section through the, through the rampart at, at, at Denison Hill. You can see these, um, these stone facings here. And we had a lot of discussion about um, how far, you know, this was anthropogenic, how far, this might have been as a result of natural processes. We've got glacier tectonized sediments here. This is a, a hill fort on a moraine. Um, so, so the geographers and archeologists were, were scratching their heads and looking at this from different perspectives. And we've also got evidence of water lane sedimentation as well, with evidence of ripples. So there's all sorts of interesting things going on. The luminescence dates haven't been confirmed yet, but they do indicate a more recent age, which puts it in the um, anthropogenic uh, camp um, for, for much of this um, stratigraphy, which is which is quite interesting. So we've gone over the edge to, to look at the exposures, but the actual archaeology that is is a sort of very thin layer at the at the top, and and um, there's very little preserved in these exposures. So the next phase was geophysical investigations of the of the site and, and excavation. And so a geophysical survey was commissioned to, um, to, to look at the structures to help identify priorities for excavation. And there's clearly quite a lot of, um, a lot of features here, quite complex. And um, two areas were, were focused on. Um, the, the area closest to the, to the cliff edge, this is a scheduled ancient monument, um, to actually do archaeological research for its own sake on, an, on a scheduled monument is quite difficult. You have to have a real rationale for why the, sh why the site should be disturbed. And a clear rationale here is that it's going to fall into the sea. And if we don't do anything with it, we're not going to find out about the importance of the site. A further investigation, a pilot investigation was taken in an adjacent field as well, which is not scheduled. And so there was more scope for exploratory work over there. So this excavation was undertaken in 2019. And um, you can see here, just the, there's a, a thick deposit of sand. It's up to a meter, a meter in places, but that is um, on top of really substantial um, uh, and very, very well preserved walls of, this is um, the, the, the walls of a roundhouse. So this is, is part of a complete um, roundhouse. And we were we really quite blown away um, uh, by by the the preservation and structures um, that that were uncovered here, um, and that they are in the um, this this trench here on the left hand side of the of the left picture. So you can see just how vulnerable this site is. You can see evidence of of mass movement and and where where the next um, kind of uh, falls are going to be. So um, so the next phase then was having uncovered these. Um, 
these sites was to take a step further and to explore um, the, um, the site more fully. So in 2021, um, Gwyneth Archaeological Trust led um, the dig. So they, we commissioned them to do the, the first dig in 2019. And then that was then used as a basis for just to, to, to apply to CADU um, for funding to expand the excavation, which was then taken over by Gwyneth Archaeological Trust. So it's involved a lot of partnership working. And um, this, um, this footage here shows the, the scale of that roundhouse that's been uncovered. Um, it's about 13 metres across with walls uh, one and a half to two metres thick in places. And my colleague Helen Roberts, as part of the first investigation, she has taken a range of luminescence samples, li samples for luminescence dating here, to help us understand how quickly was this site covered by sand? Did it happen very, very quickly? Has it been more gradual over, over time? Um, we think that it must have been quite quickly after the site um, fell into, um, uh, was, was abandoned, and I don't know whether that's the right word, because the preservation of the, the structures is, is so very good. So they must have been covered relatively quickly, we, we think, but we don't know how long it's taken that, you know, 70, to, 70 centimetres, one metre of sand to build up. So one question that we have is how do the sand layers here um, and the, the sand deposits here link to what we've got at Lincoron. Is, are they of a similar age? Can we can we um, can we correlate some of these the evidence from from these sites? The, the other thing that we've been doing is try to explore the broader landscape context. So just offshore, we've also been looking at the intertidal peats, um, and and these are these are now dated um, to seven and a half thousand years ago. So it's giving us an indication of that sort of longer term sea level change and also of the, the sort of former extent of, of, um, of the, the features here. So this is just a, a close up of the, of the excavation, which it, it's a really spectacular site in, in a stunning location, but very vulnerable, you know, really quite vulnerable as well. And this is just some examples of some of the finds um, uh, from the sites of beads and, and, um, and pottery here, but the, the, the pottery links it to um, Romano, um, Romano British um, age. Um, so there's, we don't have any dates yet on, on whether occupation extends further back into the earlier Iron Age. So we're understanding more about these sites before they're lost, and this is probably one of, if not the biggest, um, stone built roundhouse in in Wales, so it's certainly got um, you know it's certainly quite quite significant. And I say our understanding of its environmental context and that the history of what's the history of storminess got to do with the history of this site, I think, is a, is an interesting question. And we're trying to understand how quickly this site is being lost. Linked to that, we're also working at Morvedinte, the spit just to the north of the the promontory fort. And this work's being led by uh, Jeff Duller, Patrick Robson and Charlie Bristow from Birkbeck, who um, uh, has been working on the ground penetrating radar of these. So we, there's a series of beach ridges here, which um, previous work by Charlie and Commission for the Countryside Council for Wales had indicated that this is uh, uh, a, the, the, the geophysics had indicated the series of beach ridges which had been postulated to be linked to periods of increased storminess. And preliminary um, uh, luminescence dates suggest that we this, this spit is around 2,000 years, you know, started to develop around 2,000 years ago. We've got two transects here, and we've been able to go to go back and do some detailed sampling along this transect um, through um, the dunes, this longer transect here, to try to put some uh, uh, put some finer um, chronology. Uh, on that. So we've taken samples, I think it's about 12 sampling points. Um, and here, rather than coring, um, then um, we're able to use um, a, a JCB to, to dig through there. We got permission from Natural Resources Wales, who've been very supportive and are keen to understand the longer term evolution of this landscape as well. And so in the course of, you know, making these trenches for sampling, um, 
uh, shell deposits has been fine been able to look at the stratigraphy in detail as well as take luminescent samples and those those data are being worked up now but do indicate a, a history of around about two and a half thousand years of periodic um, development of, of this spit and again having those dates and having the information from across southwest Anglesey combined with the archaeological information helps to build up a broader integrated and holistic picture of, of what's going on and we can put that you know longer term framework into the to the more recent past so that's an example of the kinds of work that we've been doing in um in Wales um, and again from my paleo environmental perspective there's been an awful lot more going on in terms of monitoring and we've been working at other sites in around the coast um, on the islands and also down in Pembrokeshire as well we had a, an invest um, a uh, an excavation at Kaivai um, Fort in, in in Pembrokeshire this this summer and, and hopefully there's plans to, to go back there again so I'm going to move on and just talk a little bit about our work in Ireland and, and our paleo-environmental work in Ireland got delayed because of Covid. So um, we had initially planned to go out to Ireland to do quite an intensive campaign of field work in, in 2020 and of course had to put that on hold. But we were able to get back out last summer and to, to try to recoup some time that we'd lost. And um, as I say, we're working at a, a range of sites around the Irish coast from from north of Dublin all the way around to the Maharees Peninsula in uh, uh, over in over in Kerry, and I'm just going to talk particularly about um, the work that we've been doing in the Ballin Skelligs area, which is um, uh, on the uh, Evera Peninsula, uh, and also um, some uh, some work at Ferritas Cove. Um, and Ferritas Promontory Fort, which is um, right at the end of the Dingle Peninsula, so in the sort of far west of, of Ireland, just to give you an idea of the other kinds of work that, that we're doing. So at Ballin Skelligs, we've got an interesting, um, an interesting uh, landscape from the archaeological perspective. There's an there's an abbey here, an early early medieval abbey, which is linked to the monastic settlement on um on the the skellig the, the the skellig islands which which lie off off the coast and a really famous uh, national national monument in in ireland and we've got a, a medieval uh, castle um here as well so we've got uh, uh, some some two important and vulnerable um archaeological sites but we don't know very much about the longer term environmental history so what we've been doing is to explore a range of sites around the, the bay here um, to um, take longer records of heat, to examine the longer term uh, environmental and climatic records, but also look at that intertidal and nearshore um, preservation as well. So, for example, we've got some exposed tree stumps, which we've dated to around 4000 years ago, which is giving us an idea of sea level change. Um, We've got exposures of peat which run um, further inland and, and, and effectively represent an extension of a broader raised uh, raised estuarine bog, um, which we've been which we've been working on to produce a continuous record of change over the last six and a half thousand years. And we've replicated that record at two sites. So we're trying to kind of you know integrate in information from different sites, but also there's an element of trying to, to get some reproducibility as well. And just to give you an indication here, the, the record here that I'm showing you is a continuous record of, of peat. Um, it extends back about five metres. Um, and this is from M. Lamore just um, uh, in, in the bay there. And this is a, a record of bromine. Um, and bromine is a marine aerosol. And so we can use the um, the record of bromine in our peat sediments to, as a proxy for sea spray and and storm intensity. Now it's a little bit more complicated than that because it does um, it it does respond to changes in organic content, so we correct for that. And also there will be a sea level element as well. So as sea level changes and the the, the site location becomes further away from or closer to the sea, that might influence the intensity of our record. 
But one thing that we've seen throughout a number of records that we've developed now is, is a, an increase um, in the upper part of, the, of these records. Um, and we are seeing the, these kind of consistent, almost sort of cyclicity in, in, in storm activity that, that seems to be occurring over um, a roughly a sort of 300 um, year, year period. So there's, there's lots for us to, to sort of get in, into here and, and, and pick up. But that's the, that's the kind of information that we can get. We've also got a pollen record um, in development for this site as well, which is helping us to understand the broader environmental vegetation history and will hopefully give us some information about the environmental context um, that, um, to provide for the archaeologists as well. Our colleagues at the Discovery Programme have been working over the course of the project uh, at Ferritas Cove, right on the, the, the western uh, southwestern tip of, of Ireland. Um, and there's this sort of needle-like peninsula that, that that juts out and it, it's, um, believe me, it's pretty exposed um, to, to storm activity. And we've got a medieval castle uh, here, and then we've got some, some uh, ramparts here of a, um, a promontory fort. And there is also evidence of a number of prehistoric roundhouses. And you can see these sort of small scoops um, that are in the landscape here. And so, the excavations that they've done here is to try to understand more about those um, this the site to understand so, so, so a, an excavation was undertaken in May 2021 um, and unfortunately we weren't able to go and join our colleagues because of Covid we weren't able to travel to Ireland at that point we had to wait a little bit longer so this excavation was happening and we, we were we were watching from afar so so um, this this uh, roundhouse here was um, was excavated um, to um, to reveal um, the the sort of stone um, the stone features um, there, and um, this is a this sort of more fully sort of exposed um, uh, excavation here, and so we wanted to be able to contribute to the understanding of the site by providing some chronology, um, and we were able to go back in July and. And rather than reopening excavations, we were able to use um, percussion coring to target particular areas that have been excavated to see if we could add more information. And we've been able to get some, some um, information from the roundhouse itself. This is coring into the, this um, quadrant of the roundhouse here. So we're able to get to the, the, the occupation surface and find some charcoal in there that we've dated. And we've also been working in the in the ramparts and ditches to try to understand the stratigraphy and provide some information about the the chronology there. So this is just sort of some some examples of the kinds of, of work that we're doing. We're trying to understand these sites better um, be, before they're lost, as as well as um, contributing to that that broader monitoring perspective. We're also working. Um, uh, further in the southeast of Ireland, in in Wexford and Waterford, and this is um, another site. Um, it's a, this is a more of an estuarine site, actually, um, a medieval um, uh, township um, of Clon Mines, which is in private. Um, it, it's in private ownership and has been for many generations um, on the Banno Estuary, and the um, the the. The features here are at risk of flooding. Um, so we were asked to come in and, and do some coring to try to help understand, you know, the, the, the changes in the, um, in the estuary um, over, over the last few hundred years. And we've taken a series of cores um, in, front of, um, in front of the church and along the original quayside um, which is up in the, the sort of northern side here. And work is ongoing with that at the moment. We just did that in, in September. So we're working through all the, all the data at the moment. And again, our colleagues at the Discovery Programme are monitoring and recording these sites and, and the impacts that are being felt um, in, in, the, in the current, um, you know, with, in relation to the current challenges of climate change as well. So, so that's a kind of overview and, and really a, 
you know, with so many sites, just to kind of give you a flavour of the sorts of work that we're doing at, at, a, at a range of sites. But I, I should perhaps now come back to the question about what role can what role can our understanding of um, heritage and climate impacts on heritage um, play? And one of the things that we did for COP26 um, in the run-up to COP26 was came together with two other similar projects. Um, Citizen, which is a project based out of the Museum of London um, Archaeology, um, which is focused on community um, uh, monitoring of vulnerable coastal sites around the coast of England, and also working with SCAPE, who, um, uh, who who work closely with Historic Environment Scotland, um, based at St Andrews, that's led by um, Tom Dawson, um, and um, using that, um, the, the sort of um, bringing together these projects in Scotland, Wales, Ireland and England to talk about the impacts of climate change on coastal heritage. And I come back to the idea that people really care about their local heritage, and it's a way in to have a conversation about the impacts of climate change and it's perhaps a route that is is more accessible than talking about some of the issues around infrastructure and transport and and homes and those kinds of things it, it, it's a it's it's another route and another lens through which to look at the climate change um story and marcy rockman who's a, an american archaeologist um really developed this idea about every place has a climate story and argues that they're not just interesting and fun and nice to have, but they're essential to building our capacity to speak about and share things and place, share the things and places that matter to us most. So we work together to develop a series of climate stories about the sites that we are working on as a way of communicating the impacts of climate change, but also how um, paleo environmental and archaeological work can help us understand more about the longer term dynamics of climate change. So I think we can use the, the historical and archaeological perspective to, to uh, um, and bring that longer term context to the climate change discussion about how we move forward. And, and I think one of the things that has interested me is how we can talk about that longer term dynamic environment and perhaps remind us that these places aren't you know they they aren't permanent that whenever we look anywhere we can see that over millennia coastlines have changed and often quite dramatically and communities have had to adapt and move and perhaps that's something that we need to remember rather than trying to keep things static and defend everything is is learning to live with that longer term um uh, evolution and, and change um that 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 we are going to have to face with the challenges of, of uh, climate change. So I think I will leave it there. I'd just like to thank um, our various partners, all, all of our project partners, but other um, groups and individuals who've been involved um, at Birkbeck, um, uh, the Chrono Lab at Belfast, um, who we've been working closely with on radiocarbon dating, uh, various stakeholders, Natural Resources Wales, Gwynedd Archaeological Trust, um, uh, and, and others as well. So thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, um, I can. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that sort of that journey and that story with us. I mean, a colossal project with so many different partners and techniques, you know, over a large area. Um, I mean, I, I'm really struck with the, the challenges and the importance of what you're looking at in, in terms of learning from the past. Um, I'm, 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 hopefully we can we can receive some questions from the audience. So um, Perhaps to start things off, I, I will ask my colleague Jim Jeffers to, to, to ask a question about the implications and responses to these findings. So, Jim, would you like to pose your question? Sure, thanks, Rich. Yeah, I mean, you, you, I suppose to some extent you answered this in the talk, but I'm just curious to, to hear you say a bit more about it. I mean, are there 
are there any of the sites in 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 the project where um adaptation in the sense of protecting them is possible or is it is it inevitable that they are all going to be lost and that the the best that can be done is to preserve and, and record as much about them as, as as possible and and if it is possible to actually protect any of them is there is there anything any steps happening towards that in terms of policy or funding or anything like that yeah that's that's a really interesting point i think you know somewhere like dinner Dinclay, it's it's an obvious sort of thing that that is going to go over over time and you know if you had money to build a seawall you wouldn't put it there because you'd be wanting to spend your um, scant resources on protecting populations and and key infrastructure so and i think the national trust are really at the forefront of kind of opening up these conversations about adapting and living with change because they own a huge amount of coastline around the uk and have been really working hard in trying to emphasize the, the fact that we we can't protect everything um i think there are in the short term and medium term things that can be done um, so at some sites where they're vulnerable to you know um, more in terms of the built structures where things might be falling off but maybe securing some of those structures to to make them more stable in the face of stronger winds for example i know that's going on at, at one or two sites and um, so there, there is that element of, of maintenance one of the interesting things that dennis Dinclair mentioned is that over the course of the project we've been we've been looking at how these landslides happen and it's the intensity of the rainfall that seems to be doing the damage and these ditches and ramparts are actually funneling the water and and that's what seems to be making the um making those sort of parts of the the structure erode quicker so i think there's some potential for thinking about you know drainage at some of these sites and whether that can help slow down some of these processes but i think overall there is a certain element of inevitability about it but i think the other flip side is that sea level change climate change storminess will also uncover new archaeology that we didn't know existed so that's how scarabray was was uncovered through through storms um you know um over 100 or more years ago so there's this kind of almost kind of loss and uncovering that kind of goes hand in hand. It's not necessarily a one-way process. And one of the reasons why that the Dinas Dintley Hill Fort is so well preserved is because it's been buried in sand. And you know, over in Anglesey, where we've got those huge sand deposits, there's an awful lot of archaeology that's been protected underneath those that is yet to be discovered as well. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, a further thought from me, and it relates to these sand deposits. And earlier in your talk, you were you were mentioning your sort of chronologies and, and different phases or events that have occurred. And it, that sort of led me to think, is this a single process that is transferring and depositing the sands, or is it multiple processes? And, and if so, what implications does that have for our understanding and how we go forward? Yeah, I think I think that's that's another good point. That there's no sing, you know, there's yes storminess plays a role um and and is you know if we put our different lines of evidence together we can perhaps sort of say that some of some of our records may point to a you know this is this is the, this you know a regional pattern here or we've got different lines of evidence from multiple um types of record that are indicating there's a consistent unifying process that must be be happening here there's also the role of human activity and and you know a lot of sand dunes were used as rabbit warrens um uh, and and so that kind of destabilization could potentially make some of these sites more vulnerable to sand mobilization um, and the, the, the sort of resource use of those so so it, it's yeah i wouldn't want to sort of um make out this very simplistic that every time we get a sand layer it's a it's an individual storm or a you know that the, there's, there's, the, there's definitely more to it that, that we've got to unpick um and we might not get all the answers so I think I'm going to sit on the fence. <laughs> Probably very wise. Um, perhaps we, we, could, we can open up the opportunity for others in the audience to pose any questions they may have. Um, you can do so through the Q&A, um, but you equally you can raise your hand and you can talk. But just to reiterate, if you were to talk, you will be uh, captured on the recording. 
So an open invitation. Uh, I'm going to jump in with another one when we're waiting to see if, if anybody else has questions. Um, one of the things that, that struck me, I think Rich mentioned just in, in his in his immediate remarks after you finished, was that was the level of um, partnership involved in this project and all the different organizations that are involved. I was just kind of curious if you could say a little bit about how the project came about. You know, were, were some of those organizations already doing this sort of thing and then looking to, to develop something bigger or, or how did it come about? Yeah. Um... So we're actually based very close to the Royal Commission. They're also based in Aberystwyth and um, they and the Discovery Programme had, had started looking at some of these issues relating to, to climate change. Um, and I've got a long standing interest in, in longer term climate change records, but I hadn't worked in the coast very much, although our local bog cause of Ochno is of national and international importance ecologically but also paleoecologically so there's been an increasing interest in this idea of North Atlantic storm activity and how that's changed over the Holocene and how we didn't really know an awful lot about it um, so I was kind of interested independently in those kinds of things and I've been working with colleagues here to to um, to start to look at this these sort of potential for records of past storm activity in the in the coastal area around us and independently um our colleagues at, at the, the, the royal commission had started to, to look at these issues of, of climate change and coastal heritage and i actually popped over to the royal commission to have a very speculative conversation about whether we could do something quite small scale and maybe have some joint masters projects or something like that and then this opportunity arose that um, to, to, to develop a, a, a bigger um, a bigger project through the the island Wales territorial program so it was kind of the, the, you know it, it was evolving over a number of different levels but I, I don't you know I think we've been very fortunate to to be able to pull together those individual strands into something much larger and more coherent and I think one of the things that I've really learned is working well outside the academic research circles with stakeholders with communities with policy makers and and just learning much more about how to how to share our scientific research but also to understand the priorities of organizations outside of academia which are often very different to our own um, and and that that's been um, a real pleasure to learn more about that as, that, that aspect to um, to research as well and I, I think you have addressed one of the questions that somebody else posted was that is do you ever get the chance to work with councils and the general public uh, so i think you probably have addressed that sarah um another question was um it said thanks for an interesting presentation i was struck by what a powerful tool the visuals you presented are for making the climate crisis tangible and real for local people is it part of the remit of the project to facilitate these kinds of conversations? Yes, absolutely. So um, one of our key um, uh, uh, ways in which we're, we're monitored really and benchmarked is, is our raising awareness in coastal communities. Now, you'd often argue that coastal communities are quite aware of climate change because they're living with it um, uh, on, a, on a day to day basis. But um, we've been doing, you know, quite a lot of of engagement with communities, but also involving communities. So the excavations have been community excavations. Um, we the last year of the project is going to be focused around trying to make the most of those products and the visualizations as well to, to develop educational materials, to work with um, the different stakeholders and policy makers, but also with communities. Um, so we're hoping to develop some visualizations and animations of some of these sites. We won't be able to do it for all of them because they cost an awful lot of money. And even though we're quite well resourced, I don't think it will go that, that far to do it for all of them. But developing some, some animations and 3D models of some of our key sites um, that then will be able to, you know, to, to, to last beyond the project. So there's quite a lot planned over the next year or so to, to make the most of, of that data and, and the visualizations. The drone footage has been really powerful, actually. Um, that's something that's really got, um, that, that's captured quite a lot of attention um, from, from communities and from visitors. Um, 
and from businesses wanting to promote the area as well because um you know some quite visually appealing um uh, outputs so, so following on that thread a little bit further, is it, I mean, I, I don't know, but is there an open access public archive of, of these digital data with a, a mind to the fact that we may start to lose many of these sites at an increasing rate? So is there a, a sort of a systematic approach to digitally capture and record these sites for future generations? Yeah, yeah. So all of the information that's developed through all the data that's collected through Cherish a requirement of the funding is that it's all open access so um well while it's not all open access at the moment because we're still working through it um but it is going to be on various reposit repositories so the royal commission um have got an online database we'll be de um depositing our data with the, the various open access databases that are available to the paleo and environmental data communities but we'll also be kind of sharing it as a project as as well so so yeah and all our publications will be open access to. Thank you. Um, perhaps we just uh, offer a final call for anybody in the audience who has that pressing and burning question that they wish to ask Sarah this afternoon. There's none from anybody else. I'm going to jump in with, with one more. Go on then, Jim. Um, I mean, the project is obviously huge in what it's it's already doing. Um, I'm just wondering if you know, particularly with the, the partner organisations, are they thinking about, you know, other sites that you've not been looking at? I mean, partly what's running through my head is as, as, a, as a Donegal man is that you've you got around as far as Kerry. And there's, a whole, there's a whole West Coast there that, that's, that's not been done. That there is, and, and the same applies in Wales, that some parts of North East Wales are really vulnerable and, and going along to the Gwent levels as well. So, so you, you could extend it in all directions. I mean, I think one model that's really interesting is, is the Scottish approach, where Historic Environment Scotland have re and, and, have really, and the Scottish Government have really got behind this sort of national approach, um, looking at the sort of dynamic coasts. And, and it's, it's been more than a heritage thing. It's been, but but it's incorporated heritage into that sort of integrated approach of looking at vulnerability of climate change to climate change around the coast so i think you know there is a there is a definitely a case for um taking the approach and expanding it further um so for example wales now has um a wales coastal monitoring center is sort of trying to get a one of the issues is in both locations is actually that there isn't a sort of systematic and consistent way of recording coastal change so individual councils were doing their own coastal monitoring um and so that there are there's, there's a case to be made for trying to pull all this together at a national scale um and you know in, in in both countries to to try to to have that 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 broader approach we were we were sort of restricted on which sites we can work in because of the um the the counties that um that are in the convergence zone as it's known as where we're allowed to work so we couldn't go we couldn't go to Donegal but I think it'd be a good place to go definitely <laughs> and Sligo <laughs> thank you very much and um, well if we have no further questions Sarah I on behalf of the audience and, and, and colleagues here at HRD at, at Bath Spa I want to say thank you for your time and your insight and sharing you know, your project with us this afternoon it really has precipitated some really interesting thoughts so thank you and, and the final thing I really wish to do is just to, to, to make the audience aware that uh, we have a forthcoming um, event and that will be in May, specifically on Wednesday the 11th of May at the same time, three o'clock. And Dr. Stuart Dunning of Newcastle University will talk to us about rock avalanches and risks in, in high mountain regions, drawing on ex examples uh, from the from, from India, uh, from Bhutan, Pakistan uh, and Greenland. So at that point, I, I, again, I wish to say thank you. And that um, brings everything to a close for this afternoon. Yeah, thank, thank you all very much. Thanks for the invitation. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to see you all. So, so thanks, thanks all for coming. Thank you. I'll just add my thanks as well. Thanks, Sarah. That was a really interesting presentation that, that brought together so many aspects of climate change. 
And um, although we hadn't planned it out this way, I'm just kind of glad that um, we had a, a presentation about Ireland right on the eve of St. Patrick's Day, which worked out quite nicely. <laughs> Thanks again. There we go. Good to see you all. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye, Bye. everybody.